With me is sociologist Nicole Corato. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Natasha. Good evening. Good evening. It is 10.42 p.m. Okay, and of course, for those of you who don't know, Nicole, as well as Pat Evangelista, co-authored our Imagine Precedent series. Okay, you've been here you know, with us for quite some time. We're looking at results as they come in. What do you have to say? Initial reactions. Well, first of all, it's quite inspiring that the turnout is actually a record high turnout. And I think in the past few elections, 81% is something that we shouldn't take for granted, mm -hmm. which is probably an indication on how important this election is for a lot of people. I think the overseas absentee voting was also at an all-time high, so that's also qu quite inspiring. The results, however, are very interesting, <laughs> I think. Can we pull that up on the screen so we can... We can discuss the results so far. Yes, of course, there are no major surprises as far as the presidential race is concerned. And we can say the same thing for the vice presidential race. Um, we are expecting a very tight race between um, Senator Marcos and Congresswoman Robredo. And I think it's still hard, it's still too close to call the vice presidential race. Although I think um, for the presidential race, we see tweets about um, Senator Poe calling for a press conference mm -hmm. at some point. So. I wonder if that will be a concession speech. Yes, we're all wondering that. And now, you know, you're joining me just as Secretary Marr has occupied the the second spot. All right. Uh, and you know, in the surveys, most surveys actually, it has been uh, Senator Grace Poe consistently in the number two spot. So this 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 overtaking of Mar Rojas. How do, uh, is this something that you expected? I think in the last survey, they were statistically tied for second place. So this isn't really um, a major surprise. Mm -hmm. So we're now talking about uh, the gap between the front runner and the second and the third place. So uh -huh. no surprises there, I would say. Is the gap uh, bigger than you expected? We knew he was leading, but is this... Uh, so you Duterte know, is now at what? 38.8%. Yeah, because the last poll put him at, I think, 33%. So maybe... It's safe to infer that a lot of the undecided voters probably did go for Duterte in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, also joining us in the studio is Pat Evangelista, our Hello. very own rappler, a reporter, and all-around videographer who also co-authored uh, the Imagine Precedent series. Okay, and we've all been following the results here, so it'll be interesting to kind of see after having co-authored the series uh, what you think. We talked to Nicole, but what do you think of the results so far? Uh, well, it's an interesting narrative. I think, I think a lot of us have really focused on the presidential race. So, to look at the story of, of uh, the vice presidential race is actually equally interesting. Because uh, 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 the person who might become vice president, Marcos, is representative of quite a bit of our history. Mm -hmm. So, there are people who have said, I think it might have been... Uh, Lenny Robredo who said it might be a case of an unrepentant Marcos sitting down. And that's something that would be concerning because this, we're talking about a long history of martial law that has run through the country. So I think the question we need to ask is what does it say about us? Let's take that one step further. Let's now, you, you imagine <laughs> an imagined precedent. Let's imagine a Duterte Marcos tandem. All right. Okay. Tell me about that. You were saying, what does that say about us? Let's push that a little further. Yes, it's actually not an unexpected tandem. A lot of um, the Duterte-Marcos voters have been, um, how do you say that? They've been classified as people who would actually support a dictatorial, mm -hmm. not a dictatorial form of government, but as Duterte puts it, a dictator-like kind of governance. And in a way, we can see that there is that certain sense of nostalgia in terms of what a dictator-like form of governance can deliver. It can deliver peace, it can, order, it can deliver security, and you know, every, all the other beautiful things will follow. You'll have infrastructure, you'll mm -hmm. have jobs, you'll have investments. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of debate about, um, is that what we really need at this point? But I think, like what you said, if you push that further, I think what the administration will look like is a really like one major critique against the EDSA system that we have right now. And Patricia and I were discussing this earlier yeah. in the sense that why is the narrative like this? Yes, we have had a revolution against the Reds and we have filled our government with the Yellows. Mm. But if people are frustrated with the Yellows, how come we glamorize the Reds? Can't we come up with a new alternative narrative that can inspire the nation rather than go back to the dark days of martial law? This is not just to be moralistic about it or just to glorify um, the legacy of EDSA, but a lot of it has to do also with respecting 
um, the activists that fought for our freedom in mm. martial law. On Twitter, I see a lot of human rights activists saying, we're sorry for the, for the martyrs of martial law for bringing them back. And in a way, there's that chilling, chilling effect there that you know, they're, they're back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the martial law martyrs are just kind of guess, disappointed with the way how things turned out. Okay. I think the practical narrative, and Nicole is correct, that's what we've been talking about in that the practical narrative, at least for all of us who grew up to understand what martial law is, is supposed to be we stand up against tyranny, against human rights violations, against all of these things. And it's true that that sort of, uh, that sort of faith in that or that sort of fight has developed into uh, the EDSA perspective. You know, we stand up in EDSA. We say we don't want this anymore, and we have a new government. Unfortunately, not, that new government failed for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But that failure has been taken against also the belief that we're supposed to fight there, that we're supposed to fight mar uh, martial law, or we're supposed to fight human rights violations. So my concern is that if the narrative goes that way, do we concede that we're letting go of some rights? That this is OK, this mm -hmm. is something we accept. And as someone with a bias for human rights, that concerns me quite a lot. Does this, uh, how does this make you feel? It's only really been 29 years. You know, have Filipinos given democracy a chance? Or is 29 years not enough? Or has the democratic system failed us and you can't blame the voters for wanting to go back to something? So, you know, is it, is it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> right. I always use the metaphor of life phases. Like, just like a human being, a nation has its life phase. 30 years is pushing midlife, right? It's a period in your life where you kind of try to find yourself, find your identity. And I think that logic applies to the nation as well. Um, initially, after EDSA, there is this clear sense of identity. Everyone's using the concept of the world is looking at the Philippines. The Philippines has been glorified for um, having a peaceful revolution. And I always emphasize that this is something we don't take for granted. Mm -hmm. Not all revolutions are peaceful. Not all revolutions end up this way. Um, but 30 years is a long time. And one of the promises of democracy is redistribution redistribution of economic power, mm -hmm. redistribution of political power. The EDSA system has failed us on both fronts. We see mm -hmm. politically, it has been very exclusionary. We see fat dynasties still ruling the country. Mm -hmm. Economically, we're still waiting for the inclusive growth promised to us, um, at least by the Daang Matuid regime. So in a way, it's hard not to be sympathetic mm. to a public yes. that has mm -hmm. really been so um, discouraged, discouraged and or frustrated, frustrated mm -hmm. lacking the patience, mm -hmm. asking to how much longer should we wait for it, which probably explains the rise of Duterte because Duterte promises something urgent, something he can give now. Mm -hmm. It's very relevant. But again, if we go back to the narrative structure, then if we look at the big picture, how does this look like 30 years from now, where we are, and how will it be written in our history? So I think both of us are a bit. Concern. Not a bit, but very skeptical <laughs> about where this is going. Yeah, it's partially, it's also partially a failure of memory. It's how do you remember uh, EDSA, or not even EDSA, martial mm -hmm. law. Uh, this is what, 29, 30 years ago. I'm 30. I cannot remember EDSA, but the narrative I grew up with draws that line clearly, mm -hmm. what you say no to. But that narrative is very different from other people. and. In the beginning, when Bongbong Marcos's numbers were going up, people were saying, that's the fault of the millennials, our generation, because we cannot, we cannot remember what mm -hmm. we were not there for. But when we look at the surveys, it's not, it's not this generation. It's people who look back and think of it as a paradise, as a grand it's a place, time. it's a better mm -hmm. time. Like today, for example, I was in one of the biggest precincts in Kaloocan. There was a woman, she was uh, 89 years old. She fought her way into the precinct. She barely was able to walk. And she said, I want to stand up. I, wanna, I want to vote against Duterte because he's going to kill people. But my vice president is Bongbong Marcos. Uh -huh. I go, all right, ma'am. But that, they're represented the same way. And mm -hmm. she said, no, I was alive during martial law. And from what I remember, things were peaceful. A woman could walk from one side of the city to the other mm -hmm. safely. The same narrative Duterte uses now. So. Regardless of the truth, what matters is what story sells, what people Absolutely. want to believe. Absolutely. Okay, here's, let, let, let's turn that around, right? We're obviously, uh, you, you have expressed some concern, but do we actually think that a Duterte presidency is as bad as we imagine it to be? We hope not. 
do we think that in the last 29 years we've at least put into place a system this democracy has at least put into yeah. place a system hmm. that can prevent a dictatorship from happening so soon after again yes. well <laughs> I'd like to think so certainly and I'd like to believe whenever someone says what Duterte said was a joke he was kidding he was just playing up to the crowd but it's frightening when he says, I'm going to pardon uh, policemen for human rights violations. I will pardon myself for mass murder. Mm. So that's the reason why we say we're concerned. We don't know what to believe from a man who seems to flip one side to the other depending on the size of the crowd. So God, I hope we're paranoid. <laughs> but of course, the flip side here is... It's not just Duterte that we have to monitor here, but the kind of opposition that emerges yes. from a Duterte presidency. Mm -hmm. I think we also have to learn from the lessons of Edsa Dos, for example. I mean, I was a participant in Edsa Dos. I thought it was the right thing to do. But now I'm starting to reflect. Was it really right to oust a president who is going through an impeachment trial, who is very popular, who has corruption allegations, and is actually convicted of plunder? Mm -hmm. But in terms of... The opposition, how much does the opposition engage Rodrigo Duterte? From day one, do we have an opposition whose eyes are already on impeachment, mm -hmm. whose eyes are already on destabilization plots, just because he's not acceptable for some segments of the population? Uh -huh. So I think the best case scenario here is to have an engaged opposition, someone who can call out mm -hmm. if he will have some excesses, but an opposition that will not have their eyes set on ousting a legitimately elected president. So I'm still a bit hopeful um, but a lot of it is hinged on how our checks and balances work okay. and how they don't take advantage of the situation. Okay, so our, our latest results is from about uh, five minutes ago. Uh, Senate, uh, uh, can we pull that up, please, just so we can check out the latest results? I can tell you, though, that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I say President Duterte, I'm sorry, um, is a 38.7%. Uh, that is not a majority. And you were, you were talking about how, what, what will the opposition do now, you know, especially because right now, number two is, is the administration bet. And a complete contrast to what they were both campaigning for, continuity versus change. Uh, how likely will the Filipinos, you think, or even the system unite to support uh, Duterte? I hope they do. I mean, once he's elected, the, the trouble with a strong man coming in and saying, I'll save you all, is that it's an excuse to say, well, he came in. Mm. In three to six months, my life will be perfect. But you gotta back up the guy you elected. And even if you're the opposition, you still support him by opposing him and engaging and saying, and, and hounding him to death if necessary. But if Nix will say it's a, the value is to the opposition, I'll also say the value is to the supporters. You back him up thoroughly now. You back him up. You need to back him up reasonably after. He has to have support. Okay. We saw Metro Manila mm. a significantly vote not just for Duterte but for Marcos as well. Right. Is this surprising to you, considering Metro Manila has very high connectivity? Uh, you know. Uh, I don't want just to, to, to stereotype this, but is Metro Manila support for the Duterte Marcos tandem something that surprised you? It's not surprising to me because if I look at the satisfaction rating of President Aquino, it's lowest in NCR. Mm. The net satisfaction rating is at zero. I think that's the lowest. Okay. So in a way, if, if an election is a referendum on the legacy of the Ang Matuwid, and in NCR mm. you see here uh, an area that has a very low um, satisfaction rating with the president, mm -hmm. then I'm not surprised that they will elect candidates that really stand in stark opposition to what the president represents. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. And as someone who's had a lot of Uber rides, I'm <laughs> really not surprised. Okay. I think this is a question Nix can answer better. <laughs> I can tell you I was surprised, but uh -huh. not for any other reason that I wasn't really looking at the vice presidency. Okay. And if I did, I should have seen it coming. It's just... I did it, and now I worry more than I should. Okay, I well, let's talk about the vice presidential race because in the last hour or so, uh, Congressman, Congresswoman Lenny Robredo has cut Marcus's lead from uh, 3% to now 2%. So slowly but surely, it's a very close race. <laughs> so now let's imagine a different reality, uh, right. a Duterte-Robredo tandem. How do we feel about that? 
Oh, Patricia can create that narrative beautifully. <laughs> the Imagine Vice President. Yes. No, I, I don't, it's so odd. And I, I, I don't know how to take it. It's interesting. In that the first time I heard of this tandem, I was, I don't know where I was, but the, the ballers were coming out. Duterte Robredo. I don't know how it'll function because the diametric, they're diametrically opposite in terms of principle, even in terms of how they run their cities. Because uh, um, Robredo stood up and said, we got the same effects and the same results in Naga without having to kill people. So I don't know what that negotiation will do between them. I don't know if they even have a relationship. I can't imagine it, but it's certainly interesting. <laughs> but surely you can imagine how Lenny Robredo was able to beat Bongbong Bong Marcos. That's a beautiful narrative. Oh, that is a fantastic narrative. In, in the sense that... <laughs> I think you should finish that. No, just, just in the sense that we were talking about metaphors, or not metaphors, but parallelisms, right? So you have this widow in yellow. Oh, yes. That fighting story. a dictator's son. So this is very much a narrative. Yeah, you know? we're, that's the thing with this country. We tell this th the same story <laughs> again and again. We have a limit, though. We'll maybe tell it two or three more times until it becomes the narrative of the administration and the opposition will have to fight against it. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, the parallels are so obvious that it seems set up and made up. So it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting to us. Yeah. Here's a question. Uh, if you look at the leading presidential uh, candidate, obviously yes. Duterte, and then we have Marcos, even Lenny actually, uh, all of them are in a sense, even if Lenny's running for LP, are anti-establishment candidates, right? Because Lenny in a sense represents still someone change right not someone who's been uh, embedded in mm -hmm. politics except obviously for secretary mar but he is far behind the yeah. yeah. do you think it's people fed up with uh is it is it specifically from the aquino administration or democracy in general because i don't want to just say this is democracy versus dictatorship because we right. don't know Certainly. right yeah. we don't know uh what will happen when right. mayor duterte comes into power I i've been reading foreign news and they've been saying also he's the ultimate wild card right. we don't know uh, also because a lot of the things he says contradict with it, things he's actually done right so this this behavior or this attitude do you think it's specific to the aquino administration or to the actual governance of, of, of the nation, of democracy versus something more authoritarian? I think a big part of it is, you're right, it's risk-taking. Um, and you're also right to point out that even if Duterte has been a mayor for a very long time, in the national scene, he's very new. And the same is true for Robredo. So yes, it's, we can also cut this discussion not just in terms of the democracy authoritarian divide, but also the, polit the traditional politicians with a new type of politician. Yeah. Um, for, from very polar opposite mm -hmm. styles of governance, but nevertheless, uh, breathing fresh air into, into the very um, polluted political scene yes. in a way. Um, let's not forget that Senator Grace Poe was also banking on the same kind of narrative when she entered the presidential mm -hmm. race. She said that being new is her advantage. Because freshness was freshness, the Freshness, the yes. novelty. Mm -hmm. um, precisely because all of her competitors at that time, Binay and Rojas, were just in politics for a very long time and are unable to offer concrete and new solutions mm -hmm. to problems we face for a very long time. So in a way, yes, you're, you're right. Maybe we're looking for new faces um, in politics, in the national scale, mm -hmm. quite distinct to a vice president, yeah. quite distinct from a cabinet secretary. Right. And these are obvious um, manifestations of that desire for new politicians. Which also answers your second question, or to add to answer your second question, whether or not this has something to do with the Aquino administration. Certainly, uh, we've, we've said quite a lot in the Imagine President, a lot of the opponents to, uh, to, to Mar Rojas are essentially conducting a referendum on the Aquino administration. It's a lot of frustration, but it's frustration not so much that it's democracy or that they're Aquinos or it's liberal party, in that it hasn't served them well. In that if there is a storm, they will not be saved. If there is a conflict, they will be blamed. If a farmer gets shot, the question isn't, is he hungry? The question is, who paid for it? So that sort of thing does not lead to a lot of love or adoration from the people, and justly so. So certainly we need new faces who are different from the ones there in the hope that they will be kinder and more compassionate. Okay, but if we look at the results again, if we can pull that up, 
while uh, Mayor Duterte is at 38.7%, you still have 22% more, 22% grace, you know. And then obviously in the vice presidential race, of course you have Marcos and Lenny, both very, very close race. Uh, does it seem to you that Filipinos want change? They're just not sure what, what type, type of change and what phase that change takes. Yes, you're right. There's a lot of experimentation <laughs> happening if you, look, if you look at the results. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, if I were to be a bit more irresponsible and speculative at this point, so this is not Nicole the sociologist, but this is Nicole the person you're having a beer with, but it's liquor ban. It's Ooh. liquor ban, no beer. Yeah, she's <laughs> been very unhappy. <laughs> but nevertheless, you remember the, the unity alliance that, Sen uh, that Secretary Ross was trying to forge yes. with Grace Poe. So it's not a simple case of mathematics. If you add the Ross vote, if you add no. the Poe vote, no. then you'll beat Duterte. Yes. Because let's, re let's remember that um, Secretary Mar Ross was not the second choice for a lot of voters. Mm -hmm. When we read that survey, it's Senator, um, Senator Poe that is the second choice for a lot of people, but also because these votes are not necessarily transferable. So even if they were able to broker yeah. that alliance, it's still not a guarantee that they can defeat a Duterte presidency. Absolutely. If I were to be a bit more um, speculative about, not speculative, but kind of, um, if I were to enforce democratic norms and ethics at this point, what could have mattered more was more listening on the part of the administration mm -hmm. instead of concocting all of these strategic scenarios on how we can win over the Duterte voters or how we can yes. beat Duterte they could have listened to the electorate more and tried to reflect on the Duterte phenomenon when he was about to rise let's not yes. forget the trajectory of Duterte mm. started to to it was an upward trajectory beginning April around March and then you have an administration who will tell us Actually, Mar is gaining. Actually, he gained 2%. Right. But anyone who did elementary statistics would know this is, <laughs> dude, this is margin of error. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? And he really yes. just hovers around that 20% right. constituency. Mm -hmm. So instead of just creating that narrative that we are catching up, we actually have a shot at this. I would have wanted more reflection and more listening okay. yeah. and try to precisely understand where the frustration is coming from. Yeah, but this is also part of, of the, the Daang Matuid narrative. Mm -hmm. They're not doing anything wrong. They have never had any failures. Any criticism is manifested as because critic you mga yun, ano po ba naman sasabihin nila? Mm. So Nicole is right. Not just for the last part of the Duterte administration. Even when they were building Mar Rojas's image, instead of going uh, the fast forward in BGC or instead of carrying bags of onions, perhaps they would have tried to understand why people thought he was a whipping boy they could laugh at. Mm. Because the image was false, but they didn't er understand the image was false. So, right. a lot of listening, instead of just being defensive, would have helped him out, I think. Okay, that's actually a really good transition to what I want to ask you next. Uh, what do you think uh, are the top lessons that uh, Duterte should take from the previous administration, considering that at 74%, he is at a very comfortable uh, lead of about 5 million? Uh, wow. what, 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 lessons, wow. what lessons should he take from these elections? I think one of, I mean, I wrote this piece for Rappler. It's entitled uh, Presiden Presidency in the Age of Misery. The world has changed. We live in a world where crisis happens all the time. We live in a world where disasters happen all the time. It's nice to have a platform and a, and yeah, a platform for government that will ensure long-term benefits for the constituencies. It, it's good to have that long-term vision, but short-term response mm. is very important. When there is a disaster, the first thing you need to restore is dignity of people who were victims of that disaster. It's, it's crucial that the president understands, a, a gets a sense of urgency in responding to these problems. And I think uh, Mayor Duterte has kind of exhibited that when he talked about three to six months, when he talked about, well, killing criminals, it's kind of in, within that area. Or just sending rice immediately to Kidapawan. To Kidapawan. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of leadership, I think, that's needed at this point. When you talk to voters, especially from slum communities, and they tell you they want a compassionate leader, it's because we are in a perpetual state of crisis. We are in a humanitarian mode here. So, in a sense, what the lesson, that, uh, the lesson that we can learn from the Aquino administration is, yes, let's build on our institutions, let's invest on long-term, um, yeah, let's make long-term investments on our people through CCTs, through K-12, but the immediate response is important because it's important to restore the dignity 
of to use Lenny Robredo's term of the people in the lay lion in the mm. margins. Mm. So I, I, I really hope that Duterte can um, follow through with his promises, um, except for the threats of killing yeah. criminals, <laughs> but just the immediate response. It's badly needed. Okay. Um, I just hope he doesn't kill people, that he doesn't have to. And I really don't think you ever have to kill anyone unless they have a gun to your head. Mm -hmm. I hope he stops saying that he will kill five criminals a week. I hope he stops being misogynistic. And the reason I hope all of this is that even if he's joking, and this is benefit of the doubt already, even if he's joking, people will pick up. People will say, my president says that. My idol says that. So whatever fuckwit shows up and says I'm a shit, I'm going to take out my gun and throw it at him or hit him mm -hmm. because that's what he's done. And he's cool. And that's the same logic that can be applied to the police, where the last six years has been about reforming the police to make sure that they stand by the rule of law and maximum tolerance. And you're going to have a president who says, I'm going to pardon all of you if you screw up. Because rule of law is only applicable to particular people, not to all people. Mm -hmm. That criminals are not equal under the law. That rapists or murderers or possible drug dealers are not equal under the law. I think the point of having a criminal system is to keep good people out of jail. And to protect people from bad people. But every one person you screw over, I think that means there's a problem with the system. So it's not a numbers game, I think. I think you count people by the face and not by the statistic. Well, you know what's interesting about Mayor Duterte, though, is it's it's hard to tell when he's serious and he's not. Absolutely. Right? Because he does make misogynistic comments, but then Davao City has some of the best uh, laws for women, right? right? I mean, he he will he will say he's going to go jet ski to a spot, you know, <laughs> an island, a disputed Spratlies. island, the Spratlys, and put <coughs> a Philippine flag there. But then, on the other hand, he says, you know, I actually, the foreign policy is not my strength. I will, Just you know. Just copy policies. Right, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to predict <laughs> and it's hard what to the know presidency will look like. Because some of it is so far-fetched, you know, he has got to be kidding. But then you also don't know where he's going to draw the line or where other people will think he's serious. Like if he pisses off the United States, if he pisses off Australia, Singapore, India, and he says, I'm not good with diplomacy, but hey, please invest anyway. So we may be able to forgive him. I don't know if the world can. And I mean, this isn't all hypotheticals. There are countries in the world who's had the same experience, like the drug war in Latin America with the rise of vigilante killings, right? right? You just killed drug lords mm -hmm. and drug dealers, and look how that ended. In the United States, Barack Obama stopped calling drugs a crime. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an illness that has to be resolved. So I think even sociologically, there's this huge literature in sociology of deviance that even drug, the, the whole drug issue is founded on something else. It's, um, it's a symptom of a, bigger, of a bigger problem. So in a way, we also have to update how we understand okay. issues of crime and drugs, yeah. um, which cannot be resolved by simply killing criminals. Okay, this will be very interesting, but hold that thought. We will come back to you, but you know, we've just got the latest results. We're only at 74% right now, but I want to bring your focus to the vice presidential race. Lenny Robredo went from 3 million to now just 600,000 behind uh, Senator Marcos. This is just 70% of precincts in, very, very close. You know, the whole day she has been trailing Senator Marcos and now 600,000. And that's, that's, you know, that's a lead to cut. I mean, you went from 3 million. Yeah. Which pre precincts are we To 600,000. So most of the vote-rich provinces have voted. Um, Camarines Sur has voted as well okay. as Ilocos. Uh, so right now, we, we are looking at, let's look at, yeah, let's pull up the transmission uh, results so we can see uh, where, which results we're still waiting for. So let me, let's pull that up. Uh, let's check out the map that shows transmission status. Okay. Okay, uh, this is parties. So if we can click the show, transmission status, there we go. Okay, uh, here we can look at it closer here okay. as well. Um, green is high transmission areas, so these are done. Okay. Some of the low transmission is in the north, which we would expect to be Marcos. Yeah. Uh, but there are areas here in oh, the right. Visayas, okay. where uh, the LP, LP is LP. traditionally stronger. So 
you know, we have Marcos here. We're expecting Marcos on top uh, from those areas, and then in the middle, right. our Robredo uh, victory there. Oh, but you also have Region 8, which is Aromualdes territory. So Samar, for example. So that's also kind of... It'll be very... I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is this is going to be very, Absolutely. very close. Okay? Uh, now... Do you wish now that you had done a series on the imagined vice president? God, no. <laughs> Please, no. We, um, we may not survive past things. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think what, what makes this race so interesting and so close is that the two represent two completely different phases of change. Mm. Like exactly what you were saying. We know we want change. The voters know they want change. But does that necessarily mean going back to red? Or does it mean we just need <laughs> new, fresher faces that are, that are not that have not been in power for so long? So, what does this close race tell you? Um, I I mentioned this earlier that this election is is as much about the past as it is about the future. Mm, yeah. um, elections, or when we think about the future, as Milan Kundera would say, it's usually a void. Like it's a void. We don't know what's in the future. But sometimes when we make decisions, it's always about that segment of the past that irritates us, that makes us move, that makes us want to take charge of the future. So in a way, the elections is kind of, it's kind of like that. Um, it's a judgment on how we want to uh, reinterpret or mm. take hold of the past. So or I how think, we reimagine. Or past. how we reimagine the past. Okay. So a Bong Bong Marcos win would probably, well, revisionism is the term they often use, but I think it's a renegotiation of what the past means. Um, there's this excellent article um, by a young political scientist who said it takes a nation to raise a dictator's son. And I think that's very true. Bongbong Bong Marcos is relevant, not just because he is Bongbong Bong Marcos. This man ran for senator in 1995 and lost, but it's 2016. Mm. What mm -hmm. happens in that 10-year, 10, 10 20-year mm -hmm. difference? 20, oh God, 20-year difference. Um, yeah, and some would say the Marxists never, never left. They didn't even come back. They never left. They were just always. They were just always here. Okay. They were gracing covers of magazines. They are celebrities in their own right. So in a way, um, we have always been renegotiating the past. Except that the difference now is you have an electorate that legitimizes that sense of the past, and that is very much contentious, as mm -hmm. we can see, given the very close fight between Bongbong Bong Marcos and Lenny Robret. Mm -hmm. Yes, very close. In fact, we even went further down to 500. Oh thousand gap. Wow. I mean, this is wow. this is getting quite exciting. I feel like I'm watching a horse race. I like, wonder if there are betting pools. Somewhere. I don't know, but right now it's it's very it's very exciting. Uh, now, could you tell me from what you know, uh, Nicole? Let's go further down of the li for the live results. Let's look at the senatorial race, uh, the presidential vice presidential race. Clearly anti-establishment. <laughs> How about the senatorial races? It's a completely different trend. Again, we're Happy seeing can... all the same names. Okay. You know, Clearly fact, not anti-establishment. Yes. Okay. And, you know, is this just that it's just too much mental space to think about 12 more after choosing a president, a vice president? I mean, if you look at this, the only new name here is Riso Antiveros. The others are either, you know, uh, former senators or very much... Uh, popular names and actually the two women interestingly are the ones who are new you know we have secretary Laila de lima and uh risa Hontiveros. of course you have a world-class athlete right there, of course so manny pacquiao nine. yes you know would you consider villanueva a, a veteran here no he's fairly he's fairly new i mean i think yeah the, the of his father, campaign, right, yeah also, yes. i mean true about his father but at number one a fairly Absolutely. new name mm -hmm. and also um, not captured by the surveys I think he was uh, I have to double check this I have to be fact checked on this but he wasn't in the top no six. he wasn't actually so that's a very he was big not. surprise he actually wasn't even in the 12 uh, <laughs> yeah and now he's number one or I think he, he was ranking in the lower yeah he was in the fringes so right. but okay the, yeah the, the big surprise there is some veterans aren't in the top 12 at the moment like um, Senator Osmania is yes. not there yet. Uh, Tiji Gingona is, is not there. In yet. fact, let's pull out uh, all candidates. I just want to know what... I mean, are the voters just so confused and undecided that, you know, they vote for a change for president and vice president and not much in the, in the senatorial race? I mean, and of course, Congress is just as important in running this country. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's 
you know, or, or, do, or do you think people don't understand that, or, or what, what is it? What do you think it is? I think for a lot of senatorial candidates, their awareness level is still quite low. And of course, for you to vote someone, you have to be aware who that mm. person is. So for a lot of people, except for the old um, senators that aren't making it to the top 12, for some of the senators, like for example, I think Neri Colmenares, mm. you would think that a lot of people know him, but his awareness rate is still very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's, one factor, that's one factor there. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, the senatorial race, I suppose, is also a bit different in the sense that you have a, a, a selection of 12 people that you can, you can choose from. And yeah, people go like by the familiar. Yeah, the yeah. risk is not the that high. Names. Yeah, precisely. As opposed to the non-familiar names. And also, a, these are exclusive choices. You really just have to pick one. Whereas in the twelve, you have absolutely. a you have a range. So it has a lot more room for surprises, like Joel Villanueva. And let's not forget Grace Poe in 2013. Yes, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Okay, and um, Senator Grace Poe is actually going to have a press conference in the next uh, ten minutes now. Tell me, do you think that, uh, well, first of all, this to me is, is uh, let's go back to the presidential uh, polls, please. You know, we knew it was going to be close, but uh, Senator Poe, uh, momentum dropped. Yeah, that's right. Why, why do you think that is? I think it's because she wasn't able to reframe the discussion anymore. Because she was changed as well, right? I mean, yeah. in fact, uh, definitely more changed than Mar. And, yes. uh, you know, Mar Absolutely. has been saying continuity. She uh, said, I and, came from out of the country, got a fresh perspective, was a foundling, taking care of my parents. Look at me, I understand your drama mm -hmm. because my life is full of drama. So, yeah, absolutely fresh, new perspective. But then what changed? I mean, she was on top, right? Until uh, Mayor Duterte came in in April. Yeah, because the context has changed. When she filed her candidacy, the context then was, you're choosing between Mar Rojas and Jejo Mar mm. And a lot of people weren't satisfied with those choices, hence Grace Poe. At some point, I mean, for a very long time, she was the front runner. And at some point, everyone just conceded it's going to be a Poe presidency, and we all wonder how yes. that looks like. Yes. But then Rodrigo Duterte emerged as a front runner, who changed the landscape of these elections, reframed the narrative to don't vote for Dang Matuid, don't vote for a corrupt vice president, to vote for someone who can deliver immediate results, mm -hmm. vote for someone who's a maverick in a sense. Mm. And Senator Poe wasn't able to recapture the narrative back re or reframe the discussion back towards the end. It's hard to pin down. So what is what is the message here? What is gobierno may puso? What is that mm. compared to uh, Mayor Mayor Duterte? It was a very clear message of with an exhibit A also of Davao of Davao City. In fact, though, it's not even just Po. It's uh, Senator Escudero. Senator Cheese was on top, and is now fourth, even behind uh, Senator Allen. So you know you had uh, both. Front runners for the presidential and vice presidential race, yeah. um, both uh, <laughs> Senator Poe and Senator Chiz, both starting the polls, both at top, and now this has happened. You know, and and I wonder how much of it is a failure of the campaign of their specific campaign, right. or just the voters kind of saying. I think an argument has already been made that. Uh, announcing early and letting yourself get vetted by the public and the media that early never really pays so well. I mean, when Duterte came in, nobody really paid attention mm. to him because he kept saying, I'm not running. So when he was serious, that's when everyone looked at him and said, wait, we need to look at you further. By then, for some people, it was a little too late. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a factor. What's interesting about Senator Escudero, though, is compared to the other frontrunners who were subject to consistent attacks. Like Senator Poe was subject to consistent attacks. Yes. Vice President Bina was subject to consistent attacks. Ah, you're right. And the same is true for Bongbong Marcos. Senator Escudero was never really hit, except for his voice. <laughs> <laughs> except for his voice. But I think there are a lot of other factors to consider here. Like, what is the message of Senator Escudero? Can you think something from the top of your head? Mm. What does he stand for? If Bongbong Marcos is for unity, if, if, if Congress woman Robredo is about fighting for the marginalized. Mm. Alan Peter Cayetano is about, well, being Duterte's <laughs> vice presidential candidate. <laughs> Senator Escudero then. So I think no, the you're message... Right. husband, perhaps. Yes, so that's the thing. <laughs> but that's who, true. Who is, it's true. the message. No, you're absolutely right. That didn't occur to me. Mm -hmm. I, that I, it didn't occur to me that I didn't know what he stood for. Or that <clears throat> we never had a had direct series of criticism against uh, Senator Escudero. Yeah, Why is that? 
But I guess also because during the debates, I mean, of course, the debates don't matter as much in terms of the bo- votes, but in terms of framing himself as a candidate, framing his narrative, I don't think he took the debate seriously. You have Alan Peter Caetano going all out, defining mm. his and attacks against him. Yes. Bongbong uh-huh. Bong Marcos. Mm-hmm. And you have Congresswoman Robredo who was creating this very clear narrative of, mm-hmm. of everyone here. I'm the one who really worked with the poor. You know, these are, yes, yes, these are candidates yes. who really made an effort to distinguish themselves. And then you have Senator Escudero says, yeah, I don't really fight people. I'm just mm. here to Maybe talk about my Maybe it's the way he talks. I don't know. Give yes. the benefit of the doubt, maybe <laughs> perhaps the others sound more fresh than he does. Right. Or it's just that he's not a very interesting speaker to begin with. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, just, just pulling back now, just in terms of um, other things that have come up in these elections that are new. Obviously, mm-hmm. this is quite uh, unfamiliar the territory that we've, we've kind of touched here. And, you know, it's, it's just so interesting that six years ago, you know, the same electorate was voting for uh, President yes. Aquino and what yeah. he stood, stood for, which is democracy. Mm-hmm. And now, just six years. I mean, that's why I kept asking, do you think it's the administration and their failure? Or is it just like, that was the last chance for democracy and we've no, had it? No, I don't think so. I think we like stories. I think we bought a big story in 2010. That was a big story. We knew what we were getting into. We knew that this was a person who did not have a good legislative background, barely passed a single law, was a quiet man in the Senate, and suddenly he's president of the Republic. So, But we were willing to do that because he came with a story. He came with the possibility of grand hope. It's the same with Rodrigo Duterte. He comes in with a great story, with the possibility, again, of hope. He's given us enough to believe, but not quite enough to be sure. So. Yeah, this is the same electorate. <laughs> but it, it leaves me it still leaves me confused. Mm. Because to be fair to President Aquino, he still enjoys quite high satisfaction rating absolutely. overall. Oh, absolutely. And that's something we shouldn't take for granted. Um, I think the closest would be President Ramos. Um, President Arroyo ended at negative seventeen yes, percent. Yes, absolutely. Um, President Aquino is at positive twenty seven. So that's that's kind of a big deal. So, in a way, if people still are approving of the president, mm. how is that not transferable? Um, not just to Maros, but the legacy of the Daang Matuwi. Absolutely. I mean, but then, not, never in the history of the Philippine elections really has, has uh, the, the endorsement of a popular president or of a president really translated to votes. Unless Except that president for Corey is Aquino. your mother and she dies. <laughs> or president, to be fair, President Aquino to FDR. Ah, that's that's FDR, correct. Okay, yes. okay. But you know, the LP was banking on kind of, look at the successes of this government. All it takes is an endorsement from Aquino. Look how popular he is. Look at, or was that, was that a, a bl- blinders on? That was blinders on because the presumption was that there was no failure mm-hmm. in this administration. But... You can see on the ground the amount of frustration was pretty legitimate. Mm. Regardless of how hard they tried on top, if it doesn't go down, it's kind of not fair to assume that, hey, all it takes is an endorsement. Sure, but if you're the one who's pushing the coffin with the flag of your of, of the, 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 the country and the president of the republic doesn't show up to your burial, you kind of see a great disconnect between how good they think they are mm. and how mm. good the people are willing to attribute it to them. Okay. I think it's also the day-to-day, our day-to-day lives, basically. Our encounters with government in our day-to-day lives. So every time you ride the MRT and queue for three hours, mm. that's an indication of how, how, how well or how bad the government works. If you live in Mindanao and people get killed in a violent con- in a conflict zone, that's a referendum on the government every single day. Mm. Yeah. So it's not a surprise that Rodrigo Duterte had a very strong performance in Mindanao particularly in conflict zones and in urban centers. Mm-hmm. Because this is where we can see the failures of government every day. Of course, the narrative of the Daang Matuwid is continuity. But then it doesn't take a very critical mind to, to ask continuity of what? Mm-hmm. Of traffic? Mm-hmm. Of the mess that is the MRT? So, yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I'm not a strategist. I'm not a campaign strategist. But intuitively, something feels wrong when you run your campaign on the concept of continuity. Okay. And 81% voter turnout. That's a record. Oh, yeah, baby. Is, is that surprising to you? Or did, <clears throat> you yeah. know, what, one of my major questions was, you know, all this activity in social media, I wonder if this I even translates. I was going translates. to say, yeah. yeah. I think, I'm not sure if it translates to votes. I don't even know if it translates to change, but certainly it energized people. We didn't have this in 2010. 
um, now you can say there's going to be a rally here and people will move because mm. for once they feel like they're part of this fight they are defending Rodrigo Duterte the phrasing was we are not bullies mm. we are the bullies standing up and fighting back which is pretty much legit legitimate on its own so I think it's people like Nix who will be able to tell you if social media just does affect the outcome of an election but what I can tell you is that uh, on the ground people will say I saw it on Facebook so I decided to show up right yeah I mean it's it's very challenging it, the causation is just yeah. right. impossible to establish right. but I mean if we look at the surveys still the basic source of information for people is still the news and advertisements Social media is kind of below in that in that mm -hmm. ranking, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we always say that even if it's low in the ranking, it can frame conversations. Absolutely. In fact, even you know organizing rallies may start you know even if you weren't online, but right. just you know people and the mm -hmm. dissemination and the exponential spread of that. Right, precisely, or providing alternative sources of information. I mean. Of course, it has become so um, <laughs> polarizing. Yeah. Some people have been quite, well, not quite, but extremely mean on social media. But let's also look at the other side of it. You have people who write 2,000 word notes justifying why they're voting Absolutely, for their candidate. Yes. That takes a lot of, for people who write 2,000 word things. <laughs> Like that's, that's I not salute good. them absolutely. Me, it's a job. And for mm -hmm. people to share it like five thousand times, just you know, why I'm voting for Maros, why I'm voting for Grace Po, that's that's kind of phenomenal, yeah. right? Mm. Um, people writing in long form, justifying their votes. And from my perspective, you know, they always say vote secrecy is important in a liberal democracy. And here you are, people actually exposing their votes, justifying it to the yes. public. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. To mm -hmm. do that, plus you have the comment section where you're actually Absolutely. obliged to defend that Oh, I think that Natasha decision. and I are familiar with the comment section. I, as well that. as you are now. <laughs> yes, I think we both. Saw, I mean, not we all saw the good and the bad side of social media, right. and having written some uh, pieces that some people mm -hmm. from the comment section mm -hmm. thought was a little too opinionated for journalism. Um, what what have you learned in terms of? these elections and social media having been in the center of it yeah. and having been analyzed uh, having analyzed what 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 was being said online i think my biggest takeaway is the importance to listen and reflect um, we always say that you know it's the age of digital communication but communication is not just about voice a big part of communication is listening so if I take this reflection forward, I think especially for people like us who write on, on, on Rappler or even for people in social media in general, um, before we start making judgments about yes. other people's position, it has to come from a position of reflection. I mean, until now, I still think about the Rodrigo Duterte piece we wrote for the imagined president. Yes. It's always good to have an iterative position about it. Were we fair? Did we engage properly? Yes. What are other people saying? And when we read comments, it's always, I mean, the, the, the carefully crafted comments, mm -hmm. it's always good to reflect, um, reflect back on whether we missed out on something. Yeah. Um, so, and I think that's, that's the beauty of it. Everyone can be a content creator now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very fantastic development. I think being in social media, because I used to work in print and you don't get a lot of feedback yes. there, it fashions your opinion as well. When you're structuring a piece, when you're building your case, you're thinking, but they're going to say this. So what are you going to say against it? So it rebuilds your case because it opens your mind as well. What are they thinking? Where are they coming from? Certainly, we wouldn't have been able to characterize their followers if they didn't speak out for themselves. And that was fantastic mm -hmm. because uh, there, there, there's an elitism afoot everywhere. And it's from them, it's from us, it's from everyone else. And I think the first thing to admit is, okay, we have our own biases. Say it, acknowledge it, mm -hmm. and then take a stand. And I like that. I think it's grand that people are angry. That people are angry enough to stand up. And Agreed. certainly I would like for them to stop threatening rape, murder, mm -hmm. and every four-letter word that I am not allowed apparently to say here. But it's still good. That's that democracy. Can, yeah. I think if, if we bracket those threats, yeah. if we bracket the, the noise, we have something really good here. If yes. you have Pilipinas 2016 trending on Twitter, Absolutely. in a context where it's Jadine and Katniel Absolutely. that trends, mm -hmm. this is, this this is, is pretty phenomenal. I agree. We wrote 2,400 word pieces. I can tell you I've done this before. 
but people do not read it. Yes. So yes. it's either collaborating with Nix <laughs> makes people read my work more. That's not true. <laughs> or writing about these things. I mean, it matters, right. and I'm glad it matters in a form that has really it, it's. The written word is rarely exciting now mm, online. Especially but, that long. Yeah, but yes, now exactly. they've decided it matters. Intensity over apathy any day. No, any yes. day Absolutely. Right? We'd rather have the trolls Absolutely. and oh, right. the impassioned Facebook posts rather than not at all. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. I think what's worth monitoring now is how this energy can be, can That's transition great, yeah. to become part of assuming Rodrigo Duterte wins, but mm -hmm. I guess it's safe to assume that. <laughs> um, how this energy can be transformed to participation in governance. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best safeguards against all of our worries about dictator-like practice. If yes. the citizenry continues to be engaged, if they continue to provide arguments for whatever policy that um, president, a uh, President Duterte uh, would put forward, I think this will be even more important when we start, I, I hope it's a when rather than an if, yes. when we talk about federalism when we talk about the peace process in Mindanao, when we talk about the, the peace process penalty. or the death penalty or peace process with the communists, right? This will be a fantastic conversation and I hope it carries on. I hope we can harness that energy um, in the context of governance. Particularly within the next three to six months. <laughs> right, <laughs> Which is it. when uh, <laughs> crime will stop, according to uh, uh, front-runner Mayor Duterte. Okay.